Okay, well, welcome to the afternoon <laughs> session. <laughs> I'm Melissa Damashki. I am the Great Lakes Program Director of Sierra Club. And with me today is Valerie Burris, who is the president of the uh, Stahelen Street Tigers Block Club. And today we're going hey, to thanks. talk to you about how neighbors came to work together to install some green infrastructure in Detroit. And it not only helped with improving uh, the stormwater from going down the drain, but it also helped improve the quality of life of the block. And we're going to do this in a, a different format than the other workshops you've seen. We're uh, not going to have a, a moderator. We're not going to have one presentation followed by another presentation. What we're going to do is tell you a story. And so we're going to share with you um, how we met, how we got started, and the work that we continue to do. So with that, I'll just say a little bit about Sierra Club for those that aren't familiar. We are a national environmental grassroots organization and in the Great Lakes program in the Great Lakes we actually celebrate our 30th anniversary this year of our our program focused on protecting the Great Lakes. And a few years ago we started a Great Lakes Great Communities campaign where not only do we want to make sure that we protect the quality of the Great Lakes, but we want to make sure that we protect our communities um, in the Great Lakes region as well. We want to make sure that our communities, people, have access to clean water, that they have water to drink. I, you know, it would be terrible for me not to even mention that in Detroit, where we're coming from today, there are thousands of people that don't have water, meaning when they go to turn on the tap, there is not a drop of water that comes out. And there are serious issues that we need to address in this region that concern people. And that's what we're, we're trying to do with our, our Great Lakes, Great Communities uh, campaign in Detroit is talk about how climate change is definitely uh, driving the, the timeline of, of what we're seeing um, up faster. but that we really need to adapt in our communities to help protect our quality of our rivers and lakes, but make sure that we do it in a way that's affordable to residents. So let's tell our story. <laughs> so I'm just going to transition to the table here. So it was actually, I think it was back in 2008? 2008 that Valerie and I first met and we met at the time because uh, Sierra Club was really concerned about the sewage that we were seeing in uh, the Detroit and Rouge Rivers and at the same time uh, there were shutoffs happening in the city mass shutoffs there were 40,000 40,000 yeah. 40,000 shutoffs and when Sierra Club first uh, started talking about the the sewage infrastructure issues, uh, I remember a coworker of mine who's sitting in the audience, Rhonda Anderson, uh, Sierra Club's environmental justice organizer, telling me that Melissa, you really have to talk to Michigan Welfare Rights, and you need to talk about water affordability because that's really what's the issue here is water affordability. And I kept thinking, what does water affordability have to do with pollution? The two don't go together. And uh, she was insistent on, yes, you have to find the connection because they do go together. And you can't talk about pollution without talking about water affordability. And so that's when Rhonda introduced me to Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. And that's when I met Valerie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was a volunteer there trying to help people get their water turned back on. And um, for me, um, I even, I, I walked the blocks of the city of Detroit, knocking on doors, um, trying to get help uh, for these families. I'm trying, I'm trying not to get emotional because, you know, when I think about it, it's just really sad. Um, but anyway, um, we went out looking for resources to get people's water turned back on. We went out, um, I even made my own YouTube video, Detroit is Thirsty, trying to get people 
aware of the thousands and thousands of people who were living without water. And so um, Melissa and I met and um, she called me one day and she said, well, we're going out um, to uh, University of Michigan, Dearborn to look at a rain garden. Would you like to go? And I was like, a rain garden? What is that? You know? And so she said, um, well, just come on, come on and go. <coughs> and so I said, okay. So <clears throat> I went on out and I, I saw the garden and I was, I was just blown away, really, because I saw insects, birds, butterflies that had I hadn't seen since I was a little girl, and I'm in my 50s, so, you know, that can tell you something. And I said, I looked at Melissa, and I said, um, I want one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and so Melissa um, contacted with Friends of the Roots, Cindy, and we all came together, and um, we made it happen. And the day that they came, the volunteers came to my home to um, put the rain garden in. I was really impressed because, you know, I'm suffering with health issues. And so I said to my husband, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out here and, and help. But I did. And it helped me. It also helped me understand that if there were people coming from other communities to help us right and so they had I had an opportunity to talk to people that I probably would never talk to in my life just like I'm in this room right now this is an opportunity for me to talk to you when I probably would never have any contact with you ever in, in my life and you wouldn't have one with me and so that rain garden project it really did connect Detroit Dearborn River Rouge people came from all over and they saw the volunteers saw um, that no, Detroit does have communities. We do have homes. We're not all burnt out. We do care about our communities. And quite frankly, is in a lot of the conversations that I had with some of the volunteers, we were going through the same things. And so not only did the rain garden connect other citizens from other cities, it connected citizens on my block who were seniors and for the media attention that they were getting they weren't coming out their homes so we had to let the it was an opportunity for me anyway to let outsiders know who don't live in Detroit that we are a community we don't live behind bars we do care about our community and things like that but it will also let people on our block know that suburbanites weren't our enemy they were our friends so we came together and we put this um, project together and um, it was it was a beautiful experience and after um, we put the rain garden in my my home we put several rain gardens on the whole block people came out and um, before we get to yeah that, so one of the things we should say, though, that how this got started was um, we had worked with Michigan Welfare Rights and um, the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments and the Water Department to have a panel where we talked about both water affordability and sewage and to really have this conversation in the public about how the two were connected. And one of the things that kept being said was that infrastructure is so expensive to pay for the stormwater controls that is that is needed and, and we kept trying to say well what what's what's a cheaper solution how do we how do we make sure that we have clean water but people's water rates don't keep going up and and that's when we first heard the term green infrastructure and so green infrastructure refers to anything um, such as rain gardens uh, or swales that helps keep rainwater out of out of the drain out of the sewer system and so we started talking about rain barrels and rain gardens and and that's when we were like, well, what is this stuff? And at the time, the only place we could go to is what Valerie said, was the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, so we saw their rain garden, and it was just so awesome to see the enthusiasm from Valerie to be like, hey, I want one. Let's, <laughs> let's get the first residential rain garden right here in the city. So... Uh, this slide, just for those of you that aren't familiar with a rain garden, just shows how a rain garden is helpful. So a lot of the 
homes in Detroit have connected downspouts. Um, some have disconnected downspouts, but the downspout might go into the, or the water might empty into the driveway and then go into the street. And so what we talk about with these rain gardens is how we can disconnect a downspout and then lead the downspout to a flower garden. Um, and what's neat about these flower gardens that we refer to as rain gardens is that there's a shallow depression where that rainwater can collect and be absorbed into the ground rather than going into the sewer system. So it's a way that residents can take action to prevent rainwater from getting into the sewer system and causing the combined sewage overflows that we have in the city. And Cindy Ross with Friends of the Rouge, we have to give her a tremendous amount of credit because she helped design the, the rain gardens. She couldn't be here um, because she's getting Cindy married. married. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations to, to Cindy. Um, but uh, this was the design of the first of uh, Valerie's garden, and, and we do have some, some rain garden booklets that we brought that has this information too. Uh, one of the other things that we found out when we were researching the rain garden guides were that most rain garden guides are, uh, I'll just be blunt, are of white people planting rain gardens and protecting. And there were no rain garden guides that showed that people of color can do this as well. And so we were like, let's make a rain, make a rain guide you know I, I told my husband I said look we we're gonna be they're gonna take our pictures and we're gonna be on this guide because people uh, of african-american descent need to see that we do this and we care you know and so he said whatever you say so <laughs> so, so so we we got it done <laughs> And that picture back there was my great nephew, who is um, five years old, and he loves the rain garden. The butterflies, he loves taking the water out of the rain barrel, uh, doing the flowers, and he, he wouldn't have never had this experience had we not put that rain garden in. And so just a, a quick other piece of the story is that when we were planting this garden, Cindy was telling us about all these native plants, and, and we were both saying, what's a native plant? And and that's where we, we learned um, that they're plants that are native to the area that can tolerate our wet springs, but also the dry summers, and that they also have these incredible root systems that draw in all that, that rainwater so that it can be absorbed into the ground. So we needed a way to identify these plants because I'm not a plant expert. <laughs> and so we, we asked our, our local farmer's market, which is called Eastern Market, if they would allow us to um, work with uh, the Michigan Growers Association during Flower Day to actually go in and label all the native plants with the sticker that you see up there. It just says, Native Plants Improve Water Quality. And so that, that's what we've been doing ever since on Flower Day is we make sure we label all of those plants and then we have a table out where we talk about why native plants are so important um, for the rain gardens but just for for landscaping and Friends of the Rouge uh, helps out tremendously with, with that program as well well this is um, I went through my whole neighborhood and knocked on doors and I said listen we're going to do some rain barrels and people say what is that and I say you know when you was a little kid and grandma used to collect the rain water that's what that is and it's going to help take the stress off of the, the drainage system and so they said oh Valerie you're always doing something you're always trying to get us involved with this you know why don't you why don't you just chill why don't you just chill you know I said I am chilling because when bringing I'm, we, we have to bring quality of life back to our community we have to let the world know that Detroit is not what is being betrayed in the in the media and so in these small little things we can do we should do and so um, I, I called Melissa and I said look let's put some workshops together in our um, driveway 
and let's put some rain barrels together. And we had a tremendous um, turnout where people from the community on the block, around the corner, uh, came and put their own rain barrels together, and then they took them home. And then we helped them, showed them how to, to, to connect it. And after, folks, we are in a major, major thoroughfare, my street, goes all the way to 8 Mile in in Detroit, right? And so people come down to they just stop, but what is that? What is that? What is that? And so we had such a, a tremendous response to that, then we had a, had to have a second one. And uh, people call me all the time, when are you going to have a, another workshop for a rain barrel? I need a rain barrel. Because now they understand the importance of keeping that storm water out of the drains. And so that's something else that brought quality of uh, of life uh, to our our community. Yeah, and I think it was after that that people started talking about your rain garden. Like, well, what is this garden, and how do I get one of those? So we had the barbecue. Yeah, we had. <laughs> we put we put we put tents up in my front yard, and we had a barbecue because people the it it takes. What people need to understand, once you put the rain garden in, it takes about a year for it to blossom. So, and people weren't aware of what that was. You know, are these weeds growing? What is, what's going on? Why don't she weed whack her yard? You know, what's going on? But once the, the, the flowers start blooming and everything, people are driving down the street, they would just stop. You know, like, what is that? Because you see the depression, you see the drain going from the rain barrel down into, what is that? What is that? And so, we had a barbecue. And so at the, we put the tents up right in front in my front yard, right at the rain garden, so people could see. And we had folks um, sign up if they wanted to have a rain garden done. And then we set up a date for volunteers to come. And I think on that one day, I think we did about five or six mm -hmm. in one day. And it it was raining and everything, but we <laughs> we still stayed out there and did it. And people not just on our block but th but the volunteers from other areas and everything they they really appreciate um the rain gardens as they are now yeah and it was great we had gotten a, a grant from freshwater future um, that gives out these uh, mini grants and what we were able to do with that mini grant was to, to pay for for the rain garden. So those that signed up, we were actually able to, to pay for the cost. And of this that. particular house that you see right now is on my block, and that's a single mother with seven boys. Oh, wow. Seven boys, and they got out there and they had a ball in that garden. So that's Valerie's garden. Yes. <laughs> So it started with one, and then we got a, a couple others, and it just kind of kept growing. <laughs> so we had, I think it was after a year, we had 11 homes that either had a rain barrel, a rain garden, or both a rain barrel and a, a rain, rain garden. garden. And I mean... <laughs> Tremendous shout out to Valerie because Valerie just kept going door to door. Um, I don't know how many times yeah. he went door to yeah. door, but just kept going door to door. Well, for me, ever since I was a little girl, and I just really have to say this. When I was a little girl, you know, growing up with nine sisters and brothers, mom and daddy, in a, in a four family flat, in one flat, with all of us, what we had was community. And since I've been grown, I've been trying to recreate community. And these type of things, these type of actions create community. And that's what we need. And um, I, I really appreciate the Sierra Club because if it not had been for them, um, really I wouldn't have relationships with people other than my group. And that's just the truth. You know, I I born and raised in Detroit. I lived other places, but I live in a majority African American community, and my day to day is with African Americans. But being a volunteer with the Sierra Club has allowed me to, and allowed other people to get to know me. You know that we all are human. We all have the same wants and needs, 
And if we can uh, allow our, our differences to go by the, by the wayside, we can really get some things done. And this, this project right here, you know, really proved it, that we really, all of us just want quality of life. So then something else that was, was neat about this project was that we did have um, a couple of folks from across the city that were interested in, in planting rain gardens and learning more about rain gardens, uh, but uh, you know they needed experience with them and we thought, well, the best way to learn about a rain garden is to come out and plant one. And so with Valerie's permission, we had invited a few folks from other uh, neighborhoods and what happened was that once a couple folks from the North End community came to help plant one of the rain gardens on Valerie's block, they were like, this is great. We need to have this in our neighborhood. So the pictures you see up there are of a project house in the North End where uh, Reverend Joan Ross and Jerry Habron uh, led a, a rain garden planting in, in the back of a, a house that they have in their neighborhood to show even more people um, what it's like to plant a rain garden. And from that, we had actually invited other volunteers for that one as well. And so uh, Donna McDuffie, who's, who's at the conference here, she's actually now looking at how to plant a rain garden on the east side in her neighborhood. So it's kind of neat like how the rain gardens grew on the block, but they're also growing across the city too by involving, um, just by asking if, if folks wanted to, to join. So then last year, once again, Valerie <laughs> went door to door <laughs> and did an audit. Did an audit on not only my block, but the block behind me because we found out that our drains we're backwards where they should be going towards the Southfield Freeway, if you're familiar with Detroit. But anyway, um, we went block to block because we knew that um, the downspouts need to be disconnected in order to make a really great impact on keeping that rainwater out of the storm drains. So we went block to block and then we called Sierra Club and they came out with the kids and we went door, house to house, and we disconnected the downspouts and that was a another project that brought the community together but it also relieved some of the stress on the system yeah and uh, a few lessons learned there is that there were a lot of seniors that needed their downspouts disconnected but couldn't necessarily do, do it the work. so we um, we had teamed up with some other neighbors and um, a few students um, with some some muscle <laughs> yeah. from Wayne State University to uh, to help with the downspout disconnections for for those neighbors that that couldn't do it themselves and what we found out too in my community and a lot of communities in the city of Detroit there's a lot of seniors um, a lot of senior homeowners who can't do this work but they would love to have it done and so in in that way when you go going door to door you can find out what's really happening with people if they have water if they need food you know cuz I ask all those questions you know you need anything you know whatever whatever and I try to find those resources for them but that the downspout disconnection was another way that I found out that there was a, a, there was quite a few hungry people hungry seniors in my neighborhood and so um, after doing the downspout connection I um, contacted food banks and connected the seniors with the food banks. That's another way of this project bringing the community together and help helping the community. Yeah, and so now I think we're up to 16 homes out of the 48 homes on the block have either disconnected downspouts, connected rain barrels, planted rain gardens, or done a combination of all those things. And we continue to, to work together to try to just keep building on this effort. Um, it's something that uh, Wayne State University, their engineering department, uh, got excited about uh, trying to see that through a neighborhood initiative like this, how much stormwater can be kept out of the sewer system. And so we're currently still um, working with the water department to see if we can actually get some flow meters in the sewer system um, so that we can actually see what does 
uh, community, what kind of impact does a, a community have when, when they work together to install all of these different things that help keep rainwater out of the sewer system. And we are still trying to get some incentives from the water department for people who do um, have rain barrels and rain gardens to get some kind of credit on their water bill. Because I can say when I first put my rain barrel in, I did see a little savings in my water bill, but not so much in the last um, year or so because the water rates have went up so tremendously. So I'm not really seeing uh, a savings even though I use my rain barrel all, you know, all the time, you know. But um, we working on that with the water department to try to get some incentives um, for people who do these measures to get some kind of savings on their water bill. Yeah, I mean, we see programs all over the Great Lakes region. Um, close to us, we see the city of Ann Arbor has a water rate structure where people are re rewarded through their, their bills for having rain gardens and rain barrels. And, um, we, you know, we see similar incentive programs in Milwaukee and Chicago and other cities. So why not in Detroit? Um, and for those that are, are viewing from Detroit, we do have a campaign that's going on right now where we're collecting petition signatures uh, and urging the Detroit Board of Water Commissioners to create some kind of incentive program for residents and businesses to install green infrastructure. So so the the efforts that we were doing on Stahalen then led to this this idea where we we held a forum called Green Your Neighborhood. And what we did is we had various workshops at the local community college that was literally just a few blocks away from Stahalen. And we also brought neighborhood leaders from across the city to talk about all of the work that they're doing um, and the different projects that uh, we had we heard one garden that has a, a six thousand gallon cistern um, that's using it uh, to water the the garden that they have. We heard more stories about rain gardens, and it was just a great way to to share with one another in the city what was happening when it came to green infrastructure. And then afterwards. <laughs> Valerie led a great tour. <laughs> <laughs> after after the conference, um, the community college is only about five or six blocks away from my home. And so I said, come on, let's go see the gardens. You, you know, you have the guide, but let's go see them and talk to the people. And so um, the pictures you see there is me leading a group of people through the neighborhood to tour the gardens and even in that tour we had more people wanting to sign up on their block to get rain gardens and we should note that it was also raining that yes, day it was. <laughs> <laughs> what better way to see the garden in action <laughs> So uh, in closing, or before we go to questions, uh, we did want to show a video that the Herb Family Foundation uh, uh, paid or supported and, and filmed, just kind of highlighting uh, this project. Block Club in the city of Detroit and what you're looking at is our rain garden. Before we had all of these beautiful plants, it was just grass. Well, when I'm, should I say weeds? I had weeds. <laughs> now we have um, Coreopsis over here, wild geraniums which are purple and we have some wild strawberries growing out on the edge of it. Many of our neighbors start saying, oh, what is that, what is that, I want one, what is that, what is that? <laughs> and so once we started educating them about it, um, more people came on board to get the gardens last year. I think we planted seven. The same thing with the rain barrels. Once people understood what they were, like, what is that sitting in front of your yard? People are more friendly. They are um, sitting out of their porches more. They're talking to one another more. So yes, it is bringing quality of life back to the community. 
it might seem just like a small little thing to some people, but it's, it's really huge to us. Because some people have been on this block, believe it or not, over 40 years and didn't know who lived on this end of the block. It brings back all the butterflies and birds and insects that you wouldn't normally see in a city setting. It brings quality of life back to the community and I really appreciate that and so do my great nephews who are four years old. They love coming over here to um, water the rain garden. Okay, I also use this rainwater to wash my car and it saves on the water bill. Sierra Club's working with the community to organize workshops. What we're trying to do is we're trying to build a, a movement here in Detroit, a culture that really supports green infrastructure. And so first it starts by educating our, our residents and businesses how to do this. Then um, once we do that, our residents and businesses become great translators uh, to our uh, public officials on how to really drive this at an even bigger scale here in the city. Types of projects like this does improve the quality of life to make you want to stay and live and grow and work in the city of Detroit. <laughs> so just uh, one more thing that, that I want to add is, is uh, talking about public officials, one of the things um, that the Detroit City Council has is a green task force. And part of that green task force, we asked that they create a water subcommittee where we could really talk about green infrastructure and, and how that's a solution to stormwater. And uh, what what's neat is through that water subcommittee, uh, Tetra Tech, who's working with the, the water department, we encourage them to do a, an audit of our codes and ordinances in our city to see which ones were prohibitive to green infrastructure and which ones weren't. And so uh, they they did it, and we're looking forward to, to seeing what that that looks like in, in, I think, the end of this month or, or next month. But it's neat to see all the different levels and how everything connects and ties together and and certainly with all of the shutoffs that are happening in the city we're talking even more about how to use rain barrels to collect rainwater to flush toilets um, we're talking about how to conserve water to save money on the water bill all of that stuff any closing no I just I just really want to say I just have to say it again that um, while we have the opportunity, we hear we're talking about the Great Lakes, we really should really concentrate and talk about all the water shutoffs um, in the city of Detroit. It's, it's whole blocks are being cut off. And um, as it stands now, the, the water department really doesn't have a system to help people with no income. And we have, in the city of Detroit, um, 300,000 people from the age of 16 to 64 with no income or low, low, low income. And so it has to be some type of policy in the water department to address that. Even with the, the new so-called help that they have, you have to still come up with 10%. Well, some people don't have 10%. And how how can we all of us in this room how can we say that people don't have a right to water and uh, you know that 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 really it really bothers me the conversation keeps coming to, we know it takes money to run a system get the water clean and everything else but it has to be a way we we very smart intelligent people it has to be a way to for us to come up with with something for people to have running water in 2014 in a city that's surrounded by water So with that, let's open it up to questions, questions and conversation. You know, are water shutoffs happening in other Great Lakes cities? Yeah, I got one question, one note. Uh, I put in a lot of rain barrels and a lot of rain gardens. And the one thing that a rain garden is, is if you go into developments, we put in a final retention basin. 
which is basically a human drain garden and handles the whole development. Uh, when you disconnected your downspouts, since you live in a high density neighborhood and you don't have the grass area to absorb the water coming off the house, where do you want the water to from the downspout? That's where the rain gardens come into to play, or so that's the downspout you disconnected. You had a rain garden or a rain barrel. There, there were a few homes that we were d disconnecting downspouts in the in the backyards, mm -hmm. and so the the downspout uh, went into the the lawn in the backyard. Okay, but to fill a rain barrel from the rooftop, you know you can fill a rain barrel in about three minutes. Mm -hmm. So you still gotta have some place to put that one. Mm hmm Yeah, for 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 me. Um, Especially when we have a heavy rain, I connect my water hose to it, and it just the water just goes right into the rain garden into the grass. Oh, so you don't collect it, you just let it go. The, through the overflow. Through the overflow. Okay. There's the overflow. Mm -hmm. How was the, the big rain that Detroit had a few, what, a month ago or whatever, all that flooding? What happened in your area at that time? Well, our block didn't flood. But across the street um, from me, across the uh, Six Mile McNichols is what they called, um, it flooded. So I have to contribute that to what we've been doing on the block because we didn't have any flooding. And, and our, our basements didn't flood. A lot of basements flooded um, the, um, in other blocks, you know, but we didn't have, we didn't have that issue. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I can, you know, <laughs> and I will, you know, uh, because um, it just didn't happen on our, it j did not happen on our block. And, and there, if I remember correctly, there's one rain garden uh, right across the street from you that um, the, the homeowner experienced lots of basement backups. Uh, before we planted the rain garden, and after we planted the rain garden, she still hasn't experienced a basement backup. So we're waiting yet one more year to see if there's basement backups, and if there's not, um, we definitely do want to say that that rain garden might have helped um, in, in her case of preventing that. Now the region as a whole uh, with the storm we saw on August 11th, experienced four to five inches of rain. Some are calling it uh, what a 300-year storm. And so the infrastructure in Detroit is not designed for that kind of storm. I, the infrastructure in any Great Lakes city is not designed for a storm like that. So we did see lots of flooding on our highways, um, on our streets. Uh, but there were cert there were some areas that didn't see any flooding at all, um, and there were there's other examples of green infrastructure in the city. There's a an a, a green alleyway. Uh, there's a green roof that you saw in the video on top of the Coleman A Young Center downtown, and um, and there's a couple other rain gardens. And I I remember calling everyone the next day to see. What happened? You know, is it is it a disaster? Did it flood? Did you have leaks with the roof? What happened? And everyone said, "Nope, everything's okay." That was pretty neat to hear. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the plans for incentives for putting in some of this? We struggle with that here in Grand Rapids. Now we don't have a utility, and so we're trying to find ways to incentivize the implementation of rain barrels and rain gardens. And, and the West Michigan Environmental Action Council. We have the well, what we're trying to do is the city of Detroit has a sewerage fee um, and a drainage fee. And so through the drainage fee, we're, that's where we're collecting petition signatures and urging that the water department base the drainage fee on whether someone has rain gardens, rain barrels, or if they're doing something differently at their home so that they actually don't have um, as much drainage as the typical home they might be modeling for. And we're, we're not exactly saying what those incentives should look like, but we are saying that there are cities like Ann Arbor that 
if you have a rain garden, I think it's you get three to four dollars off of your bill every month. Um, and if you have X amount of rain barrels, you get so much money off of your bill. And certainly in our community where we're experiencing shutoffs and where we see the water rates go up, um, it definitely might be a way to involve the community in helping provide green infrastructure to get these incentives while also helping the city uh, you know, prevent this rainwater from getting into the sewer system and paying for such an ex expensive system to, to upgrade. We have a report on our table um, sustaining stormwater investments in Grand Rapids, and we have examples of incentive programs from around the country. So, you know, we've got a copy of that. You Thank you. Um, so, I'm back to the shut offs. Um, I'm just wondering now in Detroit. <coughs> Yes. Oh, so that's allowed too. Mm-hmm. And actually, there's been some bad fires where people have died. Died, yeah, trying to um, get heat or um, get electricity to uh, a small heater to just heat a space, and it's and been that, very unfortunate. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, to tell you a story, I, I volunteered with Michigan Welfare Rights, and it took me 18 months to get a family's um, heat back on. They lived 18 months through winter, all of that, without lights and gas. It took 18 months going to different United Way, different places. And I wouldn't have known about this family, but I was at a meeting. And the, uh, the woman came up to me and whispered in my ear. And I said, don't be ashamed. Tell your story. Because this is how we have to, that's the only way you're going to get help if you tell your story. It's a lot of people in the city of Detroit. And because I go door to door, it's a lot of people in the city of Detroit suffering in silence because they're afraid of all the ramifications that will come if people know that they're living without water or they're living without lights and gas because especially if they have small children their children will be taken away from them or if they're senior they'll be put in a nursing home so they suffer in silence and so it's 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 more than just a money thing we know understand that it takes money to run systems we get that but you know like i said we have to find a way to help the poorest of the poor we are all poor but we have to <laughs> the poorest of the poor we have to find a way Well, to my knowledge, the, the mayor of the city of Detroit has still not declared Detroit a disaster area for the flood. So, the reasons for that, I don't know. Um, but if your city leaders are not advocating for you, then you know the residents where you know, and you know where they're supposed to go. I 
I'm glad you asked that question because I was telling Melissa people don't ever ask that question. <laughs> for me, I it was trial and error for me. So I learned on my own. And when I learned, then I went and told other people. But there are some drawbacks. I mean, I love it, but it's, there are some drawbacks. The drawbacks to me would be um, when you plant certain, I found when we plant certain plants, the squirrels like them. So they will come right away and eat them. Okay. Weeding is not a problem, but you do have to weed um, a couple of times a year to, for all your plants to be able to breathe. Now, I planted those, those strawberries, right? Now, I like those strawberries, the little miniature strawberries. I like the fact that they're out there because it keeps the squirrels off my roof. But the strawberries will take over the garden. So you, ha you do have to, um, you know, kind of take some, thin them out. Um, but for me, um, on, on our block, I go and knock on the door and you know, sometimes I just go in the yard and start weeding. You know what I'm saying? 